G'day, I'm Dr. Kev, and this is Car Design Workshop. In this video, we're going to be looking at the steering axis. This includes caster and KPI, and how they affect the camber change throughout steering. We'll look at mechanical trail and scrub radius, and how that affects how the contact patch moves under steering. And we'll see the combination of the angle of the steering axis and the trails, inducing jacking in the suspension system. It's best to think of the steering axis as being a 3D line about which the wheel is going to rotate due to steering movements. And to define its orientation and location, we can look at two different cases. One, a front-on view, and the second, a side-on view. If we look at the front-on view, we'll see the angle between that steering axis and the center plane of the wheel will be the kingpin inclination, or KPI where that axis interacts with the ground and the difference between that and the center of the contact patch, we'll call that the scrub radius. If we look at a side view, we'll see that the angle between the steering axis and the center line of the wheel, we'll call that the caster angle. And the intersection point between that axis and the ground, and the difference between that and the contact patch, we'll call the mechanical trail. Now we have seen these in an earlier video where we were looking at the effect of forces uh, induced in under cornering and braking and what happens when we increase or decrease mechanical trail or scrub radius. But in this video we're going to be looking at the geometry effects or the kinematic effects. The first effect that we're considering in this video will be the camber change due to steering. The grip and the wear of a tyre will be dependent on its camber angle so if we're inducing a camber change due to rotation around this steering axis, it's worth considering. Looking at the effect of KPI, we see in this graph here that as we increase the KPI, we're going to get an increase in camber change as we see that steering rack move. This graph has been created with a zero caster angle, so we've isolated the effect of the KPI in the graph. Now it's fairly clear from this that the effect due to KPI, the camber change due to KPI, is non-linear. And we see that regardless of whether the steering rack is being moved to the left or the right, so whether the wheel is turning to the left or the right, we see that the steering will induce a positive camber due to KPI. If we were to do the same test, but this time change the caster angle and keep the KPI zero, we see that the steering rack moving left or right is going to induce a camber, but it will be different on the inside and outside tires. So what we'll notice is for the outside tire, a steering change will induce negative camber, and for the inside tire, the steering will induce a positive camber. And as we increase the caster, the change to camber due to steering increases. If we were to overlay these graphs and look at the effect of KPI and the effect of caster in isolation, we will see a couple of things. First, we've done the KPI here from 0 to 20 degrees KPI, which is quite a lot. The caster was changed from 0 to 10 degrees, which for caster is actually quite a lot as well. But even though the KPI has been changed by almost double what the caster has been changed by, we see that the camber effects due to KPI are lower than those due to the caster angle. So we will see that caster will have a more dominant effect on the camber induced by steering for a steering system. Now to show this at a particular point, I've grabbed about 17 mil of rack travel, which corresponds to the steering angle at a typical corner around a road. Once I have this, we can create a mesh plot of changing the caster angle and changing the KPI angle and seeing what the resultant camber would be. On this mesh plot, we see that very clearly the camber is, is less sensitive to a change in KPI and much more sensitive to a change in caster. And typically on a road car, we would see less than about six degrees of caster. The nominal caster angle for Project 171 will be about 4 degrees. The next effect that I'd like to consider in this geometry of steering is how the contact patch moves, or how the center of the contact patch moves, as we are rotating the wheels in steering. 
we will see that the axis of the steering, if it intersects with the ground, will act as a point of rotation for that contact patch center. Looking at just the front right tire, we can see the contact patch move on this blue line around this intersection point. We do see that that intersection point will also move a little bit as the vehicle is steering, and this we'll see a little bit later once we get into the jacking effects of this kinematics. In this particular case, there is 15 mils of mechanical trail and about 18 mils of scrub radius. If we were to increase the scrub radius on this, we see that the arc changes. We'll see that it'll end up with quite a bit of fore and aft movement as we increase that scrub radius. So when we have this movement of the contact patch, both in the lateral and longitudinal direction, we're going to see a change in the wheelbase as well as a change in the track. Looking at our initial case with the 15 mil of mechanical trail and 18 mil of scrub radius, we see that the wheelbase is moving relative to that steering rack movement. While the left wheelbase is moving forwards, the right wheelbase is moving rearwards and vice versa. And on average, the wheelbase slightly changes. If we move to the case where there was a larger scrub radius of about 60 millimeters, we see that the wheelbase left and right moves quite a little bit more as shown by these dashed lines. We do see a very small movement on the average wheelbase, and there is a little bit difference between the 18 and the 60 mil scrub case, but not a huge amount. We will also see an effect of the wheelbase change if we change the mechanical trail. And this is where it's useful to not really just think about the mechanical trail and scrub radius as being separate, but rather being the X and Y components of the line that joins that intersection point of the steering axis and the contact patch center. So we see if we increase the mechanical travel from about 15 millimeters to 30 millimeters, we get a wheelbase change um, as shown here. It's not as extreme as when we were changing the scrub radius, but it is a little less linear a change. And we do see that the wheelbase moves a little bit more as we've increased that mechanical trail. Just as the wheelbase will move as a function of that steering rack movement, we'll also see some track change. And with the initial conditions, we can see a track change of about five millimeters out of that 1300 millimeters. If we increase the scrub radius here, we see a noticeable increase to how much the track has been moving. Now here, we're moving from 18 millimeters of scrub radius to 60 millimeters of scrub radius, and we're seeing about a threefold increase in how much the track is changing. For the track change, the mechanical trail isn't having as large an effect. So if we increase from 15 millimeters of mechanical trail to 30 millimeters, we see an almost uh, no change in the track dimensions as we're steering the wheels. Now the third kinematic effect we want to have a look at in this video due to steering is going to be a spring deflection or a load change caused by this steering angle. Now this combination of the scrub radius and mechanical trail and the caster and the KPI is going to induce a spring deflection. Now it's worth noting here that the way we're simulating this is locking the chassis in place and changing how much the rack is extending either way. Now that's not quite how this is going to happen. If we have an average spring deflection, what we're going to see is the chassis itself will move. We can either raise or lower the chassis, and we can actually induce some roll in the chassis. Now, in order to determine how much the chassis would move, we would need to not just include the kinematics of the trails and angles, but also the spring and chassis stiffnesses. So this goes beyond just the kinematics. So we're going to keep with this locked chassis approximation and have a look at the resultant spring deflection. Here we see the spring deflection versus this steering rack travel. As we move the steering in one way, we have the left-hand side damper going up and the right-hand side going down and vice versa for the other direction of travel. 
So one way we can have a look at this is to look at the average deflection versus this steering rack travel. And we see here, on average, between the two sides, the springs are getting shorter. Now in practice, this is going to mean that there is more spring load due to this steering, and it's actually going to require the chassis to lift. Now the other way to combine these two spring deflections is to look at the difference between it and calculate an induced roll angle at the front due to steering rack travel. And this is going to induce a torque between the left and the right hand sides of the front end of the car. Now because the car overall is stationary, it's going to be in equilibrium. So any torque that is induced on the front end of the car is, has to be resisted by a change in loads at the rear end of the car. And this is what we call caster jacking. The more extreme the steering angles are, the more extreme this effect is going to be. If we were to take a video looking at the front on, on a go-kart, we would see this is quite large. Another car that would have quite a bit of steering lock, runs on quite tight and twisty tracks, would be a Formula SE car or a Formula Student car. And what I've done here is set up a camera looking at the front end of the 2014 ECU Formula SE vehicle. And if we move the steering left and right, we will see that the chassis is actually moving left and right and up and down. Now the only source of force to create this movement is coming from the driver. And the more jacking that we build into a car, the more force is going to be required at the steering system. Now some caster jacking can be quite helpful especially on cars where you have a locked rear end, so an axle or a lock diff, and it helps to unload that inside rear tire to help turn the vehicle. So now we can have a look at this jacking as we start to change some parameters. If we increase the amount of scrub radius and keep the cast of the same, we see that there is more induced front roll or more induced jacking. If we increase both the caster and the scrub radius, we see that there's an even larger effect. And we can see that in the individual damper deflections. So the increased caster and the increased scrub radius is shown as the dotted lines here. So we definitely see that increasing the scrub radius and increasing the caster will increase how much jacking effect or how much caster jacking we have in the vehicle. In a go-kart, you would tend to have quite a lot of caster and quite a lot of scrub radius. But for a road car running an open differential or a limited slip diff, we're not going to want to have huge amounts of jacking. So we're going to want fairly moderate amounts of caster and fairly low scrub radius. Now, if we change the mechanical trail and we're doubling it here from 15 to 30, we see that we're lifting the car by less. So a lot of that lifting effect is actually coming from the caster and increasing the mechanical trail with this amount of KPI is actually trying to lower the car down. But we do see that increasing the mechanical trail does also increase our caster jacking. And this is where sometimes these terms can be a little bit less helpful in that what we're looking at for the jacking effect is really the total trail, the total distance between that steering axis and the contact patch, and the inclination of the steering axis. So even though we call it caster jacking, we do see that the KPI and the mechanical trail are going to play an effect in that jacking. And if we look at that spring deflection versus steering rack travel where we have the increased mechanical trail, we do see a larger amount of spring deflection. One thing that we should note is adding that mechanical trail has made it less linear an increase. Very similar to what we looked in at the first point where we saw that the camber change due to the KPI was far less linear in that region of rack travel. We should note that in a previous video looking at the insights due to suspension loading, we did assess the scrub radius or changes to the scrub radius and mechanical trail as they affected the loading on the suspension system.
and in particular how they affected the loads going into the steering tie rods. And it was worth noting that if we wanted to keep the loads on the steering tie rods low, we wanted to see low scrub radiuses and low mechanical trails. And given that we're not really going to be wanting a lot of caster jacking in this car, there's nothing in the kinematics that we've looked at in this video that would indicate that we would want anything but a low scrub radius and a low mechanical trail from the perspective of kinematics. From a design perspective, I would usually start with deciding what you want as a mechanical trail and a scrub radius, then choose a caster angle that's somewhat moderate. Uh, I've chosen four degrees. If we look at the paper from uh, McLaren F1, we see that they chose 4.6, and you're going to find a lot of cars in that four to six degrees of caster range. And when it comes to the KPI, I'm a lot less concerned. It doesn't have as large an effect on the camber as the caster has, so you can live with a reasonable amount of KPI. So rather than trying to minimize KPI, I would try to run with a low scrub radius, and then the KPI is going to be whatever we can reach within the packaging of the wheel. But I'm happy to hear if you've got a different way that you approach this. So when you're on your way to liking and subscribing, uh, feel free to put a comment down. I do read them, and when I can, I try to get around to respond to them. Thanks for your time.